Okay, we'll get started with the preliminaries. Um, welcome back to the 2021 Careers Open Day sponsored by Ocado. Um, this next section features two speakers from uh, Atkins, uh, Tim and Beth. Uh, I'll leave the introductions to them as they get on. We're gonna split it 50-50 between Tim and Beth and have a little bit of question and answer after each one. If you want to submit your questions, do so through the Q&A function through the bottom of the, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then we'll do it, do it again up to the end of, of Beth section two. So Tim, over to you, uh, off you go. Thank you very much. Um, so I was asked to, if I could give a sort of uh, career story about my career in operation research and how I, how I came, to, came to be involved. Um, just um, from the point of view that somebody, well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say I'm at the, nearing the end of my, of my career. Um, you've probably seen the 50 badge behind, behind me in the background to give you, give you an idea of where I am. I hope I've got many years of doing something like this left, but I'm, I'm 28 years in. Uh, now. So what I thought I would do would be, sorry, I need to find the screen share button again on this, would be to give you an idea and talk about talk about um, myself and my career first of all, but I'll come into, before I hand over to Beth, who will give you much more recent and up-to-date experience, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, my current work at, at, at Atkins as well. Um, so uh, just to save you, save you listening to me, if you know that, that, that I've, I've just put together sort of the what I've done and the uh, what 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 I've what I've I've done over the last thirty years more and and uh, and some of some of the key some of the key highlights there. Um, so, like many people coming to R, I started out doing a maths degree, wondering what the uh, most relevant, useful things I could do with that were. I I I I was keen on um, computing and programming and uh, and an analysis but not but not really into the engineering side of things and sort of the hard uh, what you call applied mathematics I, I, I guess um, came across operational research in the in the careers department looking through looking through brochures um, the first thing I did was to write off lots and lots of letters to organizations that had OR groups at the time and internal operational research groups were still fairly common um, looking for summer placement jobs. I was quite lucky that I um, it, it, we were in the midst of a recession uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, I was quite lucky that of maybe 20 letters I wrote, the, probably one of the only responses I got was from the Bank of England, which had a tiny OR group of three people. Um, and I, I worked there over a summer of 1991, it was excellent place to work. Partly because I got to go into Threadneedle Street every day through marble corridors and past people in in posh waistcoats. Um, but I also got to grips with the idea that um, we were doing banknote modelling. Basically, I was trying to find out whether whether it was possible to predict the point at which. Um, the peak demand for five pound or ten pound notes would 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 happen, because at that time, you know, all, all you know, uh, there was there were probably like seventy percent of trans transactions were in cash, printing banknotes and having enough, and they they only lasted about six months at the time because they were paper. So predicting how many you would want to print was very important. Um, I used very. I, I remember having one chart from a from an article of um the spread of cash transactions of how many cash transactions at each value i'm having to copy that down and turn it into a curve in a um in a in a spreadsheet which was lotus one two three in those days the, the very latest thing um and then being able to be, be, be being able to, to to create a little model within the spreadsheet which would to use use the 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 value of rpi uh, retail price index changing through time to predict how many notes of each type you would need given the transactions and the purchase people were making so it was a very simplistic idea but it turned out to be quite powerful and you could actually track um 
how many of each note and when. Uh, I, I remember a big debate was when will the five pound note become not worth having anymore and um, and uh, or not worth printing as many and they'd need more 10 pound notes and then more 20 pound notes over over time. So it's, it's a nice little practical thing. I then went, I didn't put this on here actually, but um, I then went to Lancaster University to do the master's in operational research for a year. Um, had a great, great time there, um, learning about all sorts of other similar applications. I remember linear programming was a big thing at the time. Uh, <laughs> programming in C++ um, uh, and do, 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 doing various courses. But the, the so career really started when I joined the post office counters research group. And at that time, post office counters, I guess, as, as it is still now, was a, was a separate business within, uh, within the post office alongside Royal Mail. Um, and they had um, a research group which combined market research and operational research, which was about 40 people at the time, which was, you know, it, 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 had, it had grown over a few years. Through the process the post office were going through of basically changing their culture to be um, basically to, to make decisions on an analytical basis. They were going away from, you know, old old, old men in suits in, in meeting rooms making decisions based on what they thought was right to really underpinning with analysis. So we did, we did market research about customer perception, um, dealing with things like really trying to understand why why customers in queues got irritated because one queue was moving faster than another and what types of system would make that wouldn't make that perceived to be to be fairer um, i worked on postal orders for a long time trying to understand who was buying postal orders and doing focus groups um, with them but also doing a lot of programming i bought the um i i actually was responsible for buying the first uh GIS geographical information system within within post office counters. Um, I, I it got delivered to me on uh, Christmas Eve on uh, in 1994, and it was my best Christmas present. I got to I got to install Map Info uh, and use that at a time when we just didn't have. You know, we were doing we were doing maps by writing scripts uh, before that. So I then did a lot of post office location analysis particularly looking at looking at whether there were enough post offices and how far people lived from them and being able to process data to show and demonstrate that the network that the post office had at the time was reaching further than any other um, retail or banking network could in the country and so they just didn't have to, they knew they had a lot of post offices but they didn't know precisely what it meant to have those post offices there and being near the customers so after a after a few years of that, um, I moved into Thames Water. I was, I was interested to get into more environmental work. Um, and I moved into Thames Water, which was a very, very much more traditional OR group, um, which looked a lot at modeling of the water treatment pro processes. So I was involved in looking at the reasons, uh, the frequency with which you had to refresh filtration systems in water treatment. Um, Lots of things about trying to get into trying to get into biology about the life cycles of the bugs that actually do some of the filtration in some of the, the, the systems. Um, visiting water treatment plants all around London um, and seeing how they worked and getting a getting a feeling for the water supply. Um, leakage was the big thing in those days, though, and I think it's it's still pretty big. Um, if I'm doing this sort of talk live and I can actually see people. Which I can't at the moment, so I'm just talking to. <laughs> I'm just talking. I can only see Beth at the moment, who's who's smiling. So that that probably means I'm not talking complete rubbish. Hopefully, um, but um, if I if I if I had a lot of people, I'd probably ask you what you thought the leakage rates were and how we estimated them, and the process was really interesting there of how you started to under you you could understand leakage because there was. There was inaccuracy in the measurement of the um, the actual amount of water being uh, coming through the treatment plants, being abstracted, going through the treatment plants, and there were 
variations in readings and many, many different pipes with different readings, but abs absolutely no way of being certain about how much water was coming out of people's taps because most houses weren't metered. Um, so trying to estimate how much water was lost on the way was, it was, it, it, it was, it, it, it was, um, it was truly an estimate. Um, it came out to about 40% at the time, which is, still seems a shockingly high figure. So then um, I, I quite quickly sort of moved through that because I, was, I, I got very interested in the strategic planning aspect then because of the leakage side and how much we needed to be investing in water supply for the future and understanding the demand and how did you understand the population um, and what they what, what they would what they would need to they how much water they would need in future based on population growth based on lifestyles such as dishwashers and uh, and and garden watering and all the, the things that use them up and how much that varied um so got in, involved in in looking at the case for major reservoir being built which was never built uh, but then that's planning for you and doing these things often you often you work on something and you find that the outcome is the thing you've spent a lot of time thinking about the decision is no we shouldn't do that um and i learned through that that you should always mark that as as being a, a success if you've informed a decision even the decision is no um particularly particularly pertinent with um with 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 uh, working in transport and on highways these days because often i work on road schemes uh that uh, the answer is no and that that can be a can obviously be a good thing can be a bad thing uh for for people who would have benefited from shorter journey times but um so that was that was uh T T T thames water um I'd always wanted to get into transport and I had the opportunity after that to join what had been the British Rail OR group, which was like one of the strongest traditional OR groups that existed for, for many years. Um, it had been privatised, so it had been sold off to a company called AEA, which, in, which interestingly was the Atomic, Atomic Energy Authority's technology wing, which had been privatised just before then, then bought British Rail's OR group. And that formed a really strong um, technology and, uh, and, 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 and all sorts of consultancy um, activities within, within the railways. Um, as you'd expect, there was, a lot of, um, there was a lot of things which were to do with scheduling and timetable buildings for trains. We were going through a transition at the time from um, trying to see whether we could integrate functions of planning within the rail industry where uh, revenue and passenger demand planning had separate had uh, and the timetables for that had been done very much separately from 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 understanding the capacity of the infrastructure so signals and um, how many trains could you get um, down a particular track and there was an initiative then to build a single system that that allowed everybody to 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 look at the to 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 be to be planning the passenger demand with an eye to um using the the capacity of the of the whole railway there were some aspects of that that worked really well but one one thing it it certainly told me was that doing that was a lot more complex than it first than it first saw all sorts of inf all, all sorts of factors started to come out which were very much I guess were <clears throat> human factors about who knew what and how certain the data about the uh, about the the track capacity was and the, the signal placements because a lot of it wasn't held in the form we needed so what you expected to be a very easy thing to determine actually turned out to be turned out to be very hard and if you built a custom uh, a computer system around optimizing with poor data about the about about the the infrastructure then you couldn't optimize anything you had to have perfect data to to, to run basically to run a heuristic approach um <coughs> so i mean this is i guess i mean with the with the Thames Water thing, this is where I, I started to get very much involved uh, in it, it get, get to, to notice that a lot of my work um, was really comparing the supply of a utility or a, you know, 
um, or, or a commodity with the demand and understanding spatially where the supply was for you know for water and uh, uh, for water and where people were living, where people were working, where they needed to, to travel to as part of the part of the rail work. And that's been a theme then. Um, uh, it was particularly it was particularly evident when I was working with um, crowding on commuter trains within the within the rail industry. Uh, we had a nice little model. Um, I've written a LinkedIn article about this 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 recently, a model called Plato, which um, was used was was used to, to look at when people wanted to travel into into work in London and the, the trains available and what decisions they would make. And it could show that basically you could you could you could have extreme crowding on the most popular trains, but if you designed the timetable well and you understand the stopping patterns and where people were living and where they were bored, you could actually optimize to some, to some extent to, to, to smooth out the demand. But the one thing you couldn't do was avoid standing on the most popular trains because the more you did to expand the capacity of the most popular trains, the more people would move from other times to say, oh yeah, I don't mind standing up on that train that's, that's now got some space and I'm not crammed in completely. I will, I'll move from my half empty eight o'clock train to my quarter to nine train um, and fill that back up again. But then that became, that could become very efficient. So if you didn't understand these sort of simple rules that people, um, decisions people were making, you could plan a very inefficient system when you were trying, when you were thinking you could you could get rid of crowding, which wasn't which wasn't possible, and again that's a theme that comes up in in road building all of the time that uh, you can expand road capacity at pinch points, but it fills up again if it's where people want to drive, and trying to understand the big picture for that. So I left um, <coughs> so I left the rail industry um, when I really wanted to stand back stand back even further from that and understand how land use and transport fitted together and at the time uh, WSP um, had a group which was working on land use and transport modeling together um, which was a very sort of theoretical um, approach but very successful and has underpinned a lot of the department for transports um, approaches over the last well 20 30 years um, the, the, these the, these things have been done and I, I started working on um, modeling for Cambridgeshire particularly um, and have worked now for 15 years on various various modeling approaches to look at travel demand within Cambridgeshire and really it is a it's continuous with my work at Atkins because I, um, I, I I've, I've moved I've moved I've moved firms but not necessarily jobs in that in that set in that sense so I work I work now building similar models after having done the Cambridgeshire one for um, for uh, Bristol and Bath, North Wales, North Hampshire. Um, we've done some work overseas um, in, in various countries such as Turkey, um, uh, built, building, building models that connect the idea of where people live, um, where they work, where they go to school, etc., with the travel demand that they, that, that, that they have. What do they need in terms of travel to fill their, their daily lives? And how that relates to the to the to the transport system. Um, and finally, I guess what we've what we've got into, well, it's been un under underlying things for for a long time, is working out how that can support the path towards net zero. Um, how do we manage the fact that car journeys for some people are in, are, are inevitable, for other people are optional. And we need to move towards more and more of them have, seeing it as optional or seeing more sustainable modes. A lot of, um, excuse me, a lot of um, transport modelling um, has effectively been highway modelling um, for, for, for a long time. But I'm quite proud that the modelling I've done over 15 years has tended to be truly multimodal. So we're always putting in there the other options and making sure that we understand, you know, is the potential for walking and cycling here? How will that interact with, um, how will that interact with the choice to use a bus versus, versus driving? And the, and the problems you have that 
often your good intentions to uh to, to say put a put a cycle route in thinking people might not might might drive less often you 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 take bus users and turn them into cyclists so very nice and healthy but it's not necessarily getting people out of cars so we're trying to trying to find ways to think about that and then there's automation um we're increasingly doing um do it do it do, do, do doing automation of um the processes that we that, that we use we're using python um a lovely tool called jupyter notebooks we're putting a lot of uh systems online for 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 our clients to actually look through themselves and be able to to, to help us understand whether the data is meaningful um uh we're we're producing entire technical reports using uh using systems again linked to jupyter notebooks which which allow you to put your data into 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 spreadsheets or in or 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 in scripting scripting files um and then load them directly into a word document um which then has um which 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 then will have interactive parts in it where you don't just see a chart you actually see a movable chart that you can you you can you can flip around and zoom in and and choose different things to see or you see a map that's interactive with within the report and that's very exciting because we're 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 starting to we're starting to really learn how to communicate with interactive tools um and make that make that data really sing which is which is great so we're more and more looking for people who want to apply those sorts of digital digital skills want to want to do that but want to do it within the context of what's a really interesting problem and i've st i've stayed in transport for the last 15 years after moving around because basically there is no more interesting uh interesting problem to to to, to look at a very rewarding one i think i'll pause there to see if there's any questions at all Anybody wants to uh, ask nothing ask nothing coming through yet tim but let me ask you uh one if yeah. you had to pick out um one or it might be two projects which would you describe as your favorite one to work on and which was most successful <laughs> uh my favorite i have really fond memories of a, of a of of running scripts over a weekend when i was at the post office where we where we were we 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 were asked the question of how many people live within 2 miles of a of a post office um and we had we had like 3 days to do it for a senior board meeting where someone was meeting with a minister and they wanted to say this and nobody knew and we had to work out a way to to run scripts to and this was written in Pascal at the time, I think, to, to go through the entire Postgo database with populations and compare it to post office locations and compile, a, compile how many people live within two miles of a post office. And we had to split it up between, it was such a big problem to run. We had to split it up between four different, um, there are either 386 or 486 PCs. Uh, to, to to get it to run every weekend and someone going in to to restart things that had crashed so that was that was a that was that was just a challenge where 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 you you had to think on your feet to think the best way to do it so that was that was good um what was most successful um i think i might go back to the what i said previously about often when you work on an investment the the analysis says yeah don't do that that's not such a good idea and i won't say any specifics but sometimes you're really proud that you managed to get people to say no to something and i think that's that, that you know that that's one of the that's that's one of the major things in terms of in terms of positives i think within cambridgeshire we've influenced this is quite tricky because not everyone sees it this way but we've influenced decisions on planning that put housing in the right place that that prevent people from just building housing where it's convenient for the developers to do it and we've been able to say no you'll get a lot more benefit if you put those houses there and typically that's that's making making places accessible and we've really influenced that across cambridgeshire so i'm really proud of that <coughs> a question has just popped in and it may be related to what you've just said out of curiosity, 
is there a particular project in mind that you felt had a really significant impact more so than other projects um yeah again i i don't want to talk specifics too 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 much about about that though i actually i'll talk I'll talk about something abstract when we were doing when or that i was less direct, directly in, involved in going way back if you think about the times when in the 90s when um we were looking at uh, but when 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 schemes like the jubilee line extension were being planned or or or, or um, development of uh, Canary Wharf. Some of the models that we we were using at WSP we used for that and gave warnings about the problems that were going to really really big strategic stuff again, saying, you know, es essentially the justification that if if Canary Wharf was ever going to work, then you needed the Jubilee Line extension. Um, and I, that you know, that's pretty impactful. That that it it was it was supporting that to say, look, you. You can't you can't do this 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 style of development unless you get that transport connection right. So I think there's a lot of that, um, but I think the biggest influence is yet to come because again we we've, we've got to get net zero there and we've got to show what can be done and what can't be done. So it's sort of exciting time. I'm not looking back and saying, right, that it's it's the it's it's it's, it's the time to be really talking to clients to to understand what's achievable in terms of net zero and make sure that they're doing the things that will make the biggest difference. Great, thank you. Um, that seems like an ideal point to swap our presenters. Uh, so thanks very much uh, for your uh, section, Tim. Thanks. Uh, we may have, we have chance for some more general questions later on, but uh, yeah. let's hand over to uh, Beth. Thank you. Yep, I'm just going to try sharing my screen. So can you see some slides? Yes, we can. Okay. See if I can click on them. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Beth. I am a consultant and I sit within um, Atkins in our aerospace defence security and technology business. Um, so that's ads and I studied maths at university. I did an undergraduate in maths, and then I actually went off to go and do an operational research master's. So I've been probably where a lot of you are. I've been exactly there. Um, and I finished that in 2017. Um, so about four years ago now, and I've been with Atkins ever since. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you kind of through my career story. The whole entire time has been at Atkins. Um, and kind of take you through the different stages I have been in it. So I started as a summer placement student. I did my dissertation kind of for my master's alongside Atkins. Um, I actually joined the transportation um, division to start with, so where Tim sits, before coming over to ads and in um, February 2020. So you can see the kind of um, titles I've taken on through here in my last four years and I've been focused in on each of these now. So my summer placement, um, I did this in 2017 and this is where I completed my kind of dissertation on automation and forecasting, forecasting of accident analysis. So that's road traffic collisions as they're now called rather than accidents. Um, and I um, my university, the University of Southampton, we had the opportunity to do our dissertation aligned with business. This is kind of to help solve a business problem while having the operational research focus. Uh, I actually already had a job with Atkins, so I decided to reach out to them and see if I could align um, with them. And I had this opportunity come up. So I was looking at some kind of well, different ways to forecast um, the accident. So looking at whether a regression model would work, um, a linear one, a polynomial one, all of those kind of things. And also actually just doing some analysis on it. So where are the accident hotspots? Are there, um, looking at the difference between on a motorway where you may have less accidents, but they're more severe, um, or um, on the kind of, 
maybe some more country roads or quieter roads and how how that changes so that um, when we're looking at road schemes we can take that into account. Um, I really enjoyed this opportunity because um, it meant I had an introduction to working in that professional environment but um, actually as much as I delivered value to kind of um, future projects it the main benefit was my or I was accountable for my own dissertation so it was a really nice kind of introduction it meant I got to know the people that I was going to be working with in the future um, I could kind of start attending team meetings beforehand all of those kind of things that are really um, useful to know um, so I had about a two-week break handed in my dissertation um, I think it was at the start of September and started as a graduate transport planner. Um, I think it was like the 14th of September, so a couple of weeks later. Um, I joined what was known as an economics and business and kind of became aligned with this technical area as we evolved and kind of became a kind of more, I don't know how you'd call it, we became an early careers team, so it was easier to try lots of different things rather than being aligned to a specific area. Um, what kind of the economic side of that means is doing a lot of cost benefit analysis of transport schemes. So on the right there, I have the M25 Junction 10, which I did a fair amount of work on. Um, and you're looking at kind of transport user benefits. So things like travel time, um, reduction in collisions, um, you can look at things like driver stress and all of these and trying to monetize them to build a case for implementing the transport scheme. Um, there's kind of um, Department for Transport tools that are already available for this. And there's times when we did kind of more bespoke analysis to um, come up with these, this that kind of monetization. Um, I also had the chance to kind of look at or do some work in other areas, so things like transport strategy and then the transport modelling that Tim was talking about, I um, was doing a little bit of that at the same time. Um, after about a year and a half, I kind of moved on to being an assistant transport planner, which essentially means I was kind of taking on more responsibility with projects, um, had the opportunity to lead training sessions, both with in the UK and then I also went to India um, to go and deliver training over there and to kind of help. Um, we we're trying to build an economics team over in our India office um, so to help them have the skills and kind of actually know people. It's always nice to get to know people. Um, while over there there was some really interesting um, roadworks going on. I mean you can see at the bottom right there absolutely nothing around that and that was just in the middle of a quite a busy road um, but yeah that was a really good opportunity and something that um, they used to have obviously at the moment it's slightly different is they'd um, you had an opportunity to go and do a secondment out in India which is a really good way to integrate with the team out there try new experiences um, gain an understanding of how they work so when you come back to the UK and you're working alongside the um, India office you can you have an understanding of how their day works how I mean they're four and a half hours ahead of us um, their culture things like that so it's really good um, I also started to kind of do some project management um, taking on a small project and then also kind of being an assistant PM for a regional transport model um, and leading on economics for various different projects. So it was a really, uh, while also gaining my technical skills, I was starting to be kind of trusted and um, given the opportunity to show my leadership and management skills. Um, in, well, in February 2020, I transferred over to our ADS&T business. Um, and this was a decision where I wanted to use some slightly um, more bespoke operational research tools and develop my consultancy skills to go alongside that. Um, and I joined, kind of joined on 
the, the last six months of their graduate scheme and had the opportunity to work in a variety of clients. So I've worked with the Cabinet Office, the Ministry of Defence. Um, I was able to take part in a SCAF challenge, which is the Society of Costing Analysis and Forecasting. And this involved looking at the uh, kind of cost for 10 years of running an electric vehicle for a family of four. So really interesting way to learn about costing and how we can build that up, what kind of tools we can use to help us do that. Um, I This is a, a rather strange time for me as I joined in February 2020 and then, I mean, not six weeks later, we went into lockdown. So the, I had to build my network remotely, which is slightly more challenging. You don't have the opportunity to just pop to the kitchen pod over here someone talking about running um, cycling I don't know whatever you're interested in and to kind of tag on and make those connections that way so I provided uh, I needed a much more proactive approach to all of that um, but I managed to build my network and managed to kind of graduate our um, junior consultant scheme and become what we refer to as a consultant one um, and this was last October, um, where I have now kind of started to gain skills in cost modeling, working with a client in the MOD. Um, and I've been able to work towards my Chartered Management Consultant Award. But also, as I did quite a bit of time in transport planning, I've been able to continue to maintain my professional development scheme and keep a record of what I have learned in that time because if I ever want to go back to that domain or um, reach into those skill sets, I have a record of what I've done. Um, I've completed um, a fair amount of training courses. So I've done core consultancy skills, um, looking at things like um, how we go into a client, um, how we go about the contracting and how we should kind of exit a um, project. Um, as well as doing a women's development program and technical training on things like business analysis, um, requirements, engineering, um, building better business cases. So I've had the opportunity to do a lot here. Um, a lot of my time being a consultant, I worked on one project. Um, so it was really nice to have those variations for, with the um, trainings to allow me to develop in that time. Uh, last well, actually just a month or two ago, I was promoted to a consultant too, as we know it. And this has kind of allowed me to take on additional responsibility. So doing some line management um, for our junior consultants. So um, if you applied where in ads and where, where you would come in, I have now started line managing some of those and also taking on mentoring roles um, for some of the emerging consultants coming through the scheme, particularly those who are interested in the kind of operational research or numerical logical analysis roles. Um, I have been given the opportunity to develop a lot of business case experience in a new industry. It's a really sought after skill at the moment in um, our domain and to have that opportunity and to be trusted to kind of go out there into the client and develop as I go is um, really kind of valued for me. Um, I've also had the chance to lead events for both internal and client away days. So this is kind of when we go and have networking opportunity. We learn about what's going on in the business. Um, we can learn about other projects within our client. Um, last week, I was at the Aerospace Museum in Bristol uh, which is where we hosted our internal away day. And it was a really great day, a really good venue. Um, and I had the opportunity to go onto the Concorde, which is always very exciting. Um, I've put there, who knows, who knows where um, I'm gonna go, going to go next. Um, there's so many opportunities that I can go and take on, which is what I really value about working at um, a kind of company like this. Um, I mean, I've come from transportation and I'm now working um, in the defence industry at the moment. So 
um, and I've worked in central government. So there's loads of different ways you can go and that's something that I really value about my job. Um, I was going to touch quickly on kind of life at Atkins and what it's like working in a consultancy um, for um, operational research. So some of our kind of main skills that we need is our technical excellence. So for you guys, that's kind of your logical and numerical analytical skills um, that we kind of draw on to solve our problems. Um, being a confident communicator, quite often our clients may not actually understand the, well, the technical side of what we're doing. So it's being able to communicate the solutions and the answers that you're coming to and how you've got to them in a concise and clear way for them. And um, being self-motivated, um, which I guess is relatively self-explanatory. Um, People are the main asset in consultancy. Um, we sell people, we actually don't manufacture anything. So there's a really good drive. And as I said, I've had the opportunity to do lots of training courses because that's that's what we sell people. So they want us to be well-developed, well, well-rounded well people. Um, it's client-driven work. As much as we do occasionally work on internal projects, um, most of our work is through um, client work and that's where we make our kind of money, it's where we make our profit. Um, and there can be times when it's uncertain. Um, a key example is um, we used to do a lot of work with Heathrow, um, looking, kind of doing their security kiosks and modeling uh, how people would queue through the system and how they move through the system using tools such as Simulate and then doing lots of data analysis on it. When COVID hit, that completely stopped. He so did not have the money to do those kind of projects. So there's a little bit of uncertainty around things like that. It's all starting to pick up uh, again now, actually. And we've even started to expand to the Manchester Airport Group and looking at their kind of uh, kiosk modeling and queuing systems. Um, even when we have work, there's peaks and troughs. Um, especially when you're starting to think about um, clients' financial year ends, um, when we're working in approvals, we have to consider um, the end of the financial year and actually that's when quite a lot of budgets are kind of set for. So we have peaks and troughs coming and going in our work. Um, and obviously we're very client focused. One of the main things we have to do is keep the client happy. Um, we're trying to solve their problems. Um, sometimes they have an answer in mind and it's not the answer, not the right answer, um, not the answer we would suggest. So it's managing those kind of things, uh, making sure we're in regular contact with them and ensuring they're on board. Um, I was just gonna, oh, development and training. So this is something that I've experienced. We've got, um, Kind of developing towards specific charterships. So I work towards a management consultancy chartership at the moment. Um, there's a really good active graduate community where within your offices and I guess within the kind of wider UK. Um, mentoring and buddy schemes. So I said I'm part of a kind of mentoring role and then I also have a mentor. So these are things that are really valued within Atkins. And then obviously we're kind of standard with your social events, uh, your new staff to induction, and also the possibilities for rotations to convents, uh, cross, pro, cross business projects and job swaps. So like I said before, um, we, um, I have moved from transportation to ads and and um, there's opportunities to um, go over to India on to convent, go elsewhere. I know people, who have worked um, kind of out in the out in Dubai. Um, we have cross business projects, so um, maybe slightly controversially, HS2 uh, Atkins work on, and that's kind of across F and G. So our kind of um, one of our, I guess, divisions, and then transportation and AS and T. So there's loads of opportunities like that to work. Um, across the whole entire company. 
Um, I was just going to quickly touch on the application process on its fairly standard situational judgment test. And there's so many you can choose from. Um, I've been, I went through this about four years ago and it's fairly similar. Um, obviously at the moment it's slightly different because we're doing online um, assessment centers and business interviews. Um, but this, as you would expect, the same kind of thing. Um, these are the two kind of related grad schemes for operational research and um, uh, I guess data driven places. Um, there's a transport planning one. There's also a kind of transport planning data one. And then we have our management consultancy scheme where you can choose to go down a kind of cost modeling and analysis route as opposed to uh, maybe a project management route. Um, and all of these are on our exhibition pages as well. Um, so I guess that's all I really had to say. Um, if you want to kind of follow us and ask any questions, um, then yeah, come and see our um, exhibitors stand or online stand, um, book a meeting in and we'll happily um, talk to you. Great, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Beth. A um, couple of questions coming through, um, but I'll start with with my own. Um, what about your favourite project? What have you enjoyed most? Um, that's really hard. I mean, I've worked on quite a lot of projects. Actually, I worked on a project when I was over in transportation on a business case for a new junction, and I drove past it a couple of weeks ago and um, I went to my partner I was like oh my gosh I worked on that I worked on that that's so exciting and being able to see it actually being built was um, like and having input into that so I think that's probably um, one of my favorite things I've done so far. <laughs> and it sounds like they listen to your advice. <laughs> yes hopefully we'll see when the junction's finished being built. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you're stuck in traffic there, you might think otherwise. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, this is one that Tim has answered uh, by typing the answer in, but we'll let's ask it again to get your views too. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that doing an, an OR master's is necessary to get into the field or would it be doable to just have a maths degree? Um, I think it's... I wouldn't say it's necessary and um, exactly the same as kind of Tim has said, it's nice. Um, and having the mathematical background is just showing that you have the logical and numerical side. So that's kind of the main thing that from a business modeling and analysis side we look for is um, you can develop a lot of skills as you go along. Um, and a lot of what we do is the application of things. So um, you can pick that up as you go along. Um, so I think it's it's one of those things where it's slightly more common, like Tim said, to do it now. And therefore, it does put you kind of a level up, but it's not a necessary thing. And if you're a good candidate, then you'll be assessed on that. Yeah, I think I would agree with that from a general point of view, too. Um, I think having a master's makes you more employable. Uh, and so perhaps higher up the picking list perhaps but it's certainly possible to do so without um without uh, the master's degree uh, definitely yeah. a, a tricky decision about whether to make that investment but um yeah doesn't certainly doesn't rule anything out does it yeah i, I mean we we we're, we're really happy either, either either way um in terms of in terms of master's degrees i mean a, a lot of people coming in to our area have sort of engineering backgrounds but I, I'm particularly keen that we get more people who are either have a master's degree or or have the sort of uh, the, 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 the general um, numeric background and simply the interest in in problem solving in these in these areas because um, uh, complementing with different skills is, is is really where it's at for me that uh, we, I, I work with a lot of people who are specialist uh, you know, career transport planners or, or 
civil engineers um, as, as, as well to different disciplines. But what we're finding more and more is mixing them with people who are modelers, uh, computer scientists, uh, data scientists. And, and the OR for me sits into that sweet bit in the middle where you're, where you're communicating on both sides and that's that's where it's where 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 it's great. So it's just it's bringing that it's it's bringing bringing that 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 way of thinking into things. And wherever you've got you've got that from, or whether we can help you sort of get into the the, the way of thinking, that's all that's all good. <laughs> really. Okay, we've got a uh, another question popped in. We've got a partial question. So if the person that tried to do that would have another go at that, that would be useful. Um, okay, the second one, I'm looking at the transport modeler and data analysis role and, and under the candidate information it says development application and documentation of macro modeling using software like Saturn ME slash yeah. two question really how how familiar do you need to be with these sort of packages. Yeah. Um, the, the, no, you don't need to be familiar with those packages. I mean, it's nice if you, if 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 you were, then 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 that's great. But the vast majority of people that we that we that we we take on will not have training in in those, and we bring that. Um, we 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 deliver what we reckon to to to, to try and deliver seventy percent of our training needs within projects, which we think is good for the people and good for good 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 as a good as a way to do it and and we'll regularly be taking it's one of the it's one of the the the, the actually one of the things i enjoy most i don't do a lot of training in saturn specific packages but taking people and saying okay this is what we're doing and, and being able to take people up a learning curve is is all part is all part of what we do so yeah bring the bring the skills bring the attitude bring the bring the interest uh and and, 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 and we'll supply the domain knowledge that you need. I didn't have any experience in any transport modeling software when I started. And by the end of it, um, I knew it quite well um, when I ended up moving over. Uh, there's things that we kind of said about budding and mentoring. You'll find that actually sometimes you'll almost in your home office have someone who knows it very well and you can just go to them, pick up the phone there are um, kind of formal training courses as well in Saturn. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the best way to learn sometimes is just by doing it and yeah. running a model and being like, oh, that's not right. I'm going to do it <laughs> kind of again. Um, so. Yeah, and I think any, on, but supported. Yeah. any experience in, in that kind of data handling, data analysis, programming is useful for whatever job you're going for yeah. in, in this kind of field. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I'm not sure I picked up when you were talking about, but how many people do you have across the business who are in this kind of role? You do your bit, Beth. Uh, I'd say within our area of the business, so in aerospace, well, ADS and T, aerospace, defense, security, and technology. That's why we shortened it. It's just such a mouthful. Um, there's there's probably about twenty of us at the moment, but it's something we're really trying to expand on. We have seen a, quite a lot of client demand for it. So, um, and there's areas of operational research that we haven't quite tapped into yet, and that we know there's client demand of. So we're trying to recruit those capabilities as well as developing them internally. So we're at about twenty at the moment. Um, on the transport modeling side we we reckon to be overall for transport modeling the biggest team in the in in, in the country at about a hundred um with with about another 20 or 30 in um in our, our um, global technical center in in bangalore um which by the way if anybody uh if if anybody who's sort of watching this from overseas uh you know opportunities to go and work in bank to, to, to work in Bangalore if that's where you're based that suits you we have an office in Dubai as well that's associated with this this, this sort of thing um, but of 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 those probably half all the time are highway um, modelers who may be more 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 design and engineering focused 
but what we're seeing again with with the net zero world upon us that the, the focus on high on highways and highway design is going to shift and the the focus much more on how do people travel why do they travel what are the alternatives that people do to traveling such as sitting here we're almost talking about access planning including uh, online activities now and so i think we'll be shifting much more into the mindset that we that we need to to to, to be more bespoke in our approaches and more of those people will be you know will, will be in or style style roles in future this is out of um i think 300 transport planners and 100 of them are transport modelers which is quite a high proportion as well the transport planners doing the doing the um, planning applications and development proposals and uh, and, a, and a lot of urban design work um, so you know we're quite a we're quite a strong force within within transport in Atkins great um, well nothing more coming through at the moment um, we're running towards the end of our allotted time so I'd like to uh, thank you both uh, for your time and your, your contribution uh, some really interesting stuff there and some great opportunities for working uh, at Atkins. I think Beth mentioned that you, you've got a, uh, more information at your exhibitor booth via the platform, so I'd encourage folk to go and visit that and the other exhibitors too. Um, the schedule now is there's a half an hour break between the end of this talk and the start of the next one uh, at three o'clock. So do go away, have a little bit of a break, but go back to visiting the, the platform uh, and talking with, uh, with, with people about the opportunities. So thanks again both uh, and thanks everyone for attending and listening. Cheerio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.